Hey, Will. Hey, Bob. How you doing? I can't complain. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show on Blogging Heads TV. You are Will Wilkinson, familiar to many of our viewers and podcast listeners. Although you haven't graced our site in a while, i got to say. It's been a little while. been yeah. busy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I, have we asked? I mean, come on. Let's, <laughs> let's get clear here on the relative status. I mean, don't act. Like we send you an email every day, and you're like, right? I mean, not 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 every day, but no. Well, okay, yeah. once a week. Anyway, mm -hmm. we're glad you could make it. Uh, for those of you, who, uh, our viewers who aren't familiar with you, you are now vice president for policy at the. Can you pronounce this word for me? The Niskanen Center. The Niskanen Center, whose uh, mission statement says that it is devoted to the exploitation of the working class. Is that a fair characterization? Um, that's 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 just a small part of what we do. <laughs> Why don't you tell us where where you would situate the center ideologically? Uh, the Niskanen Center is uh, um, the, the 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 barbarous uh, uh, coinage is a libertarian, pretty mm. much. It's mm. a it, it's a it's a kind of uh, uh, moderate libertarian uh, organization with a uh, pragmatic bent. Uh, so we're founded by. Cato Institute veterans who, uh, for one reason or another, uh, found it uh, you know, advantageous to uh, try a different tack. Mm -hmm. And uh, at Niskanen, we're a little bit more pragmatic than the standard uh, mm -hmm. think tank. So, you know, the normal model is to just, you know, write a white paper and roll it up into a tiny scroll and attach it to the leg of a carrier pigeon and then just go congress you know and kind of hope something happens uh, For me, that is we not do a little bit more on the ground um uh, uh advocacy and uh lobbying uh in the halls of our nation's capital um and uh you know and aren't trying to shoot for libertopia uh we're more interested in you know marginal change that you know leaves us all mm -hmm. freer and happier and Mm -hmm. Healthier, healthier. Liber, liber, libertarian is a coinage we owe to Brink Lindsay, an early, an early blogging heads contributor, mm -hmm. um, and a, a Cato uh, alumnus himself, I believe. Now, you may wonder why I'm having you here, Will, and the answer is this: you know, I've had a series of conversations about Donald Trump lately. What happens is, I have the conversation. Some commenter says, "Oh, Bob's having another liberal on who hates Trump to bash Trump," and I thought, you know, they're right. I should broaden my horizons. I should get a libertarian who hates Trump <laughs> to yeah. come on and bash Trump. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, maybe we'll go eventually all the way out to libertarians who hate Trump. And they can bash Trump. But actually, you know, I, I think, honestly, you're a reasonably good stand-in for, for a, a libertarian. You, I, you, you're, you, I think you straddle the libertarian-libertarian divide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, so I'm a, I'm a libertarian. To libertarian. That's exactly. You took the word right out of my mm -hmm. mouth. So let's talk. But the, actually, honestly, and seriously, mm -hmm. I want to talk about Trump in a more cosmic context than he has sometimes talked about. Mm -hmm. I want to talk not just about Trump, but Trumpism, and I want to look at that in the global sweep of history. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask, among other things, like. How much of this is just inevitable? I mean, leaving aside Trump the person and the distinctive, let's say, stamp he has put on this thing we call Trumpism, the fact is, you know, this is happening, broadly speaking, in other countries. In Europe, there are movements that are in some ways comparable. So one question is, how much of this is just kind of what inevitably happens when you have a planet that's moving toward globalization and, you know, economies are becoming more intertwined and a certain amount of sovereignty is in some sense being lost. There's, uh, you know, global capitalism tends to bring a mixing of populations, as you documented in a, in a recent Vox piece that we will link to. Um, I mean, so, so do you see this as, you know, as just a, an almost generic thing that kind of had to happen and you figure out a way to deal with it or what? Uh, that's, a, that's a hard question. Um, I mean, it, in one sense, like the so the part of part of the difficult part of the question is figuring out what like a a reasonable sort of default setting for the world is, or like what the baseline is, um, and 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 
if you see the sort of contemporary global liberal political order as um, a certain kind of outlier, which it is. Um, what do you mean by that? That, it, that, that it, it's just historically extremely unusual. Where we are um, right now, politically. W- w- just yeah, just politically, economically. You know, so since the you know the advent of the Westphalian nation state and the you know the beginning of the era of modern economic growth, uh, we've become incredibly rich. We've become incredibly free. There's all these you know a, a lot of stuff you you know catalog in non-zero we seem to have figured out how to uh how to um play positive sum games a bit better uh we keep kind of expanding those games so that the the world order that we're living in and and you know poverty is at like an all-time low we're going through this era of incredible peace um like in some ways we've never had it better um but you know one of the most powerful forces in the cosmos is, you know, regression to the mean. Um, and in some ways, this kind of, like, populist nationalism, f- to me, feels like um, uh, just sort of reversion to um, a kind of, you know, natural um, human political impulse uh, that, that, you know, that, that that is just very, very powerful. Getting away from it, like, resisting that... Uh, is how we got to where we are, um, but in some ways it seems kind of unrealistic to expect it to just be, you know, indefinitely sustainable or to be, um, you know, progressive in a, you know, ongoing way forever. Uh, so, th- so in that sense, I think there might be a kind of inevitability to it. Um, that's a long answer to that question, but 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 uh, um, but maybe we were, uh, you know, we were just flying too close to the sun, Bob. <laughs> um, okay, so another way, um, and when you say some kind of backlash was inevitable, you mean because people are naturally tribalistic, or do you mean, uh, as is commonly said, that no, actually there are actual losers in the process, or at least people who's, uh, who don't benefit enough from the, from the, the process of globalization in relative terms uh, to feel like they're really being served by it, right? The people who look around and go, oh, these other people are doing better than I am. Meanwhile, uh, these things I had taken for granted about my life are changing because of technological change and diversification, uh, ethnically, and so on. Uh, so, so, you know, to what extent, in a way I'm asking, to what extent do you think there are um, legitimate grievances? By the way, Will, you just reverted to a, a mere snapshot of yourself. Did you just... Um, I might have accidentally pushed a button. <laughs> well, the good th- good news is we're still recording, and so this uh, this really perilous moment in the history of blogging heads is being documented for posterity. Um, I will try to fix this. Okay. Meanwhile, we can you can keep talking. You know, most of our audience, to be honest, is actually a podcast audience. And so Am I our, back? You're back. Yes. Uh, and 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 you're better than ever. And, and if I can recall what I was saying, it was like, what about the the standard? You know, I mean, it's often put in other ways. That wait a second, these people are either losers or not winners in the process. I mean, in terms of how it serves them. And you know, there's this famous uh, graph that shows that, like, uh, you know, globally, the the welfare of people in the aggregate has gotten way better over the last few decades. But if you look at the people who haven't really benefited, it's this kind of segment in the middle of the income distribution of already modernized, uh, largely Western economies, right? Meanwhile, you know, poverty is dropping radically in East Asia, South Asia. But the fact is that these people are not imagining that they're not really, you know, getting a lot out of this. The, the people in America. Yeah. Um I mean, I, I think it's I think it's all of those things. Um, um, so I, I I don't I don't think the the distributive aspect is the most important thing. I think it is important, um, like, like making sure that everybody is uh, doing progressively better. I think is uh, you know vital for maintaining a kind of like popular buy-in to a sort of liberal economic system. 
Um, so I, I do think that the you know the American safety net is shitty. Um, that there's been all sorts of um, that we have a a kind of cronyist economy. There's been a lot of um, upward redistribution. There's a uh, we have you know let a lot of people fall behind. Uh, there have been people who were losers from uh, globalization um, and automation who we've done very little to help and we could have helped better. Um, but I don't really think those are the pri- that, that that's the primary issue. Um, uh, the from so one of the interesting things about when cultures get richer is that people become um, more liberal. I don't know if you know this sort of whole Ronald Engelhart kind of post-materialist uh, social change. He's, uh, he's the guy and, who did the Global Values Survey. Or? Yeah, he does the World Values Survey. And, and I've been looking at that stuff uh, a lot recently. And, 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 and the general idea is that as um, places get richer, as people get further away from um, sort of objective necessity and, and material insecurity, uh, their values reorient uh, uh, away from um, survival and more toward just satisfaction. You kind of go up, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and the wealthier cultures get, the more they start to care about, um, you know, I want to really express the inner me, you know, like I want to, I want a career that really suits my, you know, right. person. Like, you know, you don't think about that when you're struggling to get by. Like, you just do what you have to do, right? You don't like, oh, do I want to be an art history major or do I want to be a, mm-hmm. you know, a, 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 a historian of 18th century science? Like, you don't, that doesn't come up, like, because it doesn't matter. You just have to make sure that your kids don't die. Um, so you see this, and, and you see it very, very strongly. So there's a very strong relationship between a move, uh, between economic growth and a move away from survival values towards what, uh, you know, Ingo Harkar's self-expressive values, or one of his colleagues, Christian Velzel, calls uh, emancipative values. Um, and that's one dimension of this. There's another dimension, which is, you know, from sort of traditional modes of authority to secular, rational Sort of modes of authority, so kind of from religion to science, uh, and the uh, place that that's accorded in society, and places tend to move towards a more rational, secular uh, notion of authority as they uh, become wealthier. But it's a little less strong than the connection between uh, wealth and um, emancipative values or or self-expression values. Now, w- one of the in a big country. Uh, like the U.S., um, those kinds of, you know, so, so that the economic changes are not evenly distributed, right? So that's, the, the, and, and so the cultural change that uh, is incident upon the, uh, upon the, upon the economic change isn't necessarily going to be evenly distributed. Um, and in any case, any kind of social change um, you know, there's there's a there's a there's a there's a leading edge of it. There's an avant-garde, um, and there's the kind of trailing edge, um, and over time, it can be moving really really fast for part of the population, and part of the population can just be kind of sitting still. Uh, and in fact, over the last couple decades, there's a little animation on the World Value Survey site. The U.S. has actually gone backwards in terms of self-expression values. And by the way, I'm, I'm emphasizing these self-expression values. I kind of skipped a step in a way. Um, because they correlate super, super, super highly with um, just liberal democratic institutions. Hmm. And so if you look at indices of where people are the most free, uh, that have the best sort of democratic political institutions, anything you like, political freedom, economic freedom, whatever you want to measure, those things correlate really, really highly with people having these self-expression values, okay. um, and, and and so um, that that to be a liberal people in some sense means that the people have these values, and, and, and those are reflected what, in institutions. Over what time frame has American been? I don't know if you'd call it regressing or stagnating or or, or what, but um, over what what period of time are we talking that that the self-expression variable has dropped a little in America? Um, I'm not. 
totally certain, but I think over the last uh, couple decades, like 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 I think like in, in about 1996. So mm-hmm. so the U.S. is pretty far out, um, you know, toward the frontier of self-expressive cultures. Uh, in 1996, it was so about 20 years ago. Um, it was you know really out in the you know in the leading cluster of countries mm-hmm. you know i think it was right next to new zealand mm-hmm. and since then it's just kind of dropped back a bit so it's not so it's not super dramatic it's still among the more um, self expressive countries but the the thing that i want to point out about that is that that that, that aggregate reduction mm-hmm. um is going to hide a lot of heterogeneity in the population right so i think Big cities. Uh, I live in a college town. Super progressive. Those places have become more and more and more emancipative, emancipative or self-expressive or liberal. Um, and if there is a- aggregate um, regression towards survival values, that actually shows that there's a big chunk of the population uh, that is moving in the different in a different direction. And what you're getting is a kind of division in the sort of basic moral framework of the members of the country and we, we keep hearing all this stuff about anti-elitism um, and I think a lot of a lot of that is what it is that that, that there is this uh, um, just kind of a complete breakdown and kind of cultural understanding or, or communication between sort of different strata of the American population and they can't even see the other segment of the population's morality as a morality. Mm-hmm. It just looks like wrongness. Okay, so this is, I mean, this is, to some extent, this is something you hear. I mean, you hear about a resentment of cosmopolitan elites, of the so-called mm-hmm. cultural elites. You know, and, and actually, this has been a Republican talking point ever since Dan Quayle, to some extent. There's been a little bit of a conscious cultivation of a resentment against the so-called cultural elites. Uh, yep. and, uh, but that's so. So you're saying like like the the cultural elites are on the self expression side of of the scale, and that mm-hmm. is now one source of the resentment or the tension. That there's there's a divergence of values there, and I guess the idea that you know the the elites uh, spend their time deciding whether to whether to teach you know art history or or history of science feeds into this idea that you know. Well, it feeds into the whole what I would imagine is the critique of them from from the kind of stereotypical Trump voter, right? Yeah. So yeah, they, 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 they like these people. Are, you know, they're disconnected from the facts of life, the the, the fundamental, you know, rigors of survival, uh, having a family, making a living. They're just mm-hmm. you know insulated and you know kind of buffered from all of these forces, and they like to talk about privilege all the time. Um, but uh, but don't really realize how uh, how coddled uh, their privilege really makes them. Mm-hmm. And of course, something something puts people in the mood to resent people, <clears throat> right? And we've talked about what maybe some of the factors. You know, the income distribution hasn't been as even as might have been optimal, uh, and and so on. And the, you know, these these commonly cited things that you know it's not about unemployment rate per se, but about stability of job. Will my kids be able to count on this and that? Have wages been run? There, there, there's all of that, uh, but there's more to it than that, I assume. In, t- in terms of things that put people in a mood to resent uh, other people. And, and by the way, I don't want to say this is one sided. We can later talk about the attitudes of the so called elites toward the people in the heartland and whether uh, those could use some those attitudes could use some amending themselves but but to focus on the resentment of the elites what other conditions do you see uh, you know feeding into that um, well I, I mean some of its political um, the, it, it, so but you know uh, it, a year and a half ago, so you know, before I took this job in the scan, and I was working at the Economist, and I was covering the election, uh, and uh, so I was covering the Iowa caucuses or the run-up to the caucuses. You know, and the f- first thing that Ted Cruz did to launch his campaign in Iowa was to have this, you know, rally for religious liberty, um, and 
the reason that seemed like a good idea to Ted Cruz, who did win the caucus narrowly, um, was that there's this deep sense among uh, many Christians and conservatives that the elites have basically scheduled their faith and way of life, way of life for a kind of you know slow motion extinction. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, and if you read, if you just like read, you know, some right wing media, you get this sense that that people literally believe that there's a conspiracy to make their faith illegal. Um, and there's just enough, um, um, I, I would say, a liberal intolerance for uh, religious conservatives to give that a kind of real credibility. So it might seem really trivial to you if you're a cosmopolitan urban elite, these cases about like whether or not you have to bake a birthday or you know, a wedding cake for uh, a gay wedding. Um, but that really feels like the thin edge of the wedge to lots of religious conservatives. Um, and there's a sense that if you don't fight back against the elites, they're going to wipe us out, right? And, and, uh, and that creates a, a, a really dramatic, antagonistic political climate. I don't know if you watched the craziness that was going on in North Carolina with the with the uh, governor was wouldn't step down, and then the Republican legislator tried to gut you know the, the powers of the mm -hmm. incoming Democratic uh, governor, and and you're like, what is that all about? Well, but prior to that, there was all this craziness there about transgender bathrooms, and you know, and and the issue of transgender or you know, like it just like it's it's literally affects no one <laughs> to, a, to, to a first approximation it affects no one there there there, there are, there are uh, d trans people who it affects and it's important um, uh, but it's you know the issue is a symbolic issue right. and it's about whether or not people with a traditional sexual morality are going to be allowed to have it right that's what they think it's about um, and 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 so I think that's part of it too. That the, it, and but this is part of what I mean by this kind of breakdown in the ability to recognize um, a, a religious or traditional morality as a morality, um, as something that, uh, that 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 merits a certain kind of um, respect, mm -hmm. rather than as a um, as a just a. a, a a form of oppressive mythology that helps reinforce um, a structure of injustice. Mm -hmm. So where does this put you as somebody with, you know, on the social issues, basically libertarian uh, instincts? So in other words, you're, you're all for certainly, you know, tolerance of people of, of, of various sexual identities. Um, but do you think um, that that the that the government has gone too far, too fast, or um, uh, in, in in trying to legislate uh, kind of consensus on these issues, or what? I think a little bit of it is there's two. You know, like it's it's this is something I've changed my mind about since the election. Since the election is, uh, um, I. Because I'm as as elitist a cosmopolitan liberal as you can get. Like like I I'm I'm way out there on you know I you know I think you should be able to marry your dog or a robot or uh, you know a clone of yourself or what I like it like so I I am not uh, anywhere near anybody's idea of a tra traditional morality. Um, uh, and and I was you know I've been really really pleased to see the sort of progressive social change that we've had and. Uh, and and when the gay marriage issue was coming up, um, I, I I felt a little uneasy about the Supreme Court decision. Um, like I thought that might be pushing um, people, um, but mostly I was just really happy about it, and I liked like seeing YouTube's of lesbians getting married in Tulsa, and because they made me cry, and I was really happy about it. Um, and uh, but now I. I really do think that it's actually an un, 
uh, an underrated source of the kind of backlash that we're having. That that things were going along fine. Lots of states were uh, here in Iowa. The Supreme Court, you um, know, legalized gay marriage on basically. Uh, equal protection sorts of grounds. It was happening in a number of states. Even better, a number of states um, uh, legalized gay marriage through legislative means, which has even greater sort of popular legitimacy. Uh, and I think that's the preferable course. That over you, things were kind of moving along. We should have just let it move along. Uh, and that this kind of very decisive moment, where you know, still we hadn't got to half the country having. We have kind of already come around to this view. Having it imposed on people, I think, really created an alarming view, just like it alarmed a lot of conservatives. Of like, okay, they are out for us. They're going to make our our worldview illegal. Um, you know, that's not necessarily what it means. You know, like, just allowing there to be gay marriages doesn't mean like, but you know. But the, I think the perception is that it's basically the whole kind of traditional religious, especially sexual morality and family morality, was just coming under siege by the state, um, created this sense of alarm that it was a really good, um, really fertile grounds for a kind of populace to come along and exploit. The amazing thing is that Donald Trump, of all people, was able to exploit it. Um, you know, because like if you were here in Iowa, you know, and, and you know, uh, Ted Cruz, who's you know kind of oleaginous, and 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 you may, have to, you may have to define that word for some of our viewers and for me. Well, he's a little bit greasy, uh, and uh, yeah, and and, and you anyhow. know, and he's you know, and he's just you know, he started you know, he's you know, like you know, let's start this rally with a prayer, and just mm -hmm. being like you know, as pious as you could be, and you know, he's like you know, you know, he's, and you know, he's, so he's pretending to like you know be you know God's crusader. Uh, and, and Donald Trump, who, you know, believes in God, who knows, right? Like, well, and he says he does not ask God for forgiveness. He says that coming out of the gate. You yeah. Know? Yeah. So he's, you'd think that would be a problem for him. Apparently not politically, but no. And what, and, and, and watching, watching the caucus, like the, 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 the reason Cruz was able to win here was because the evangelicals held on here being Iowa where you are. Yeah. Yeah. Where they, 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 but there was this really, really hot debate, um, uh, you know, within the right, right, like about like how this guy wasn't Christian enough. But sooner or later, that just collapsed, mm -hmm. right? Like all the Christians came around, and and I don't know if you saw like that. This is one of the most amazing things about sort of just the way the partisan mind works. That you know, like before the election, um, you know, if you ask the survey question, how important is it for a leader to have, um, you know. A good moral character, something like that. Evangelicals were, you know, as likely as anybody to say that's very, very important. Um, but after they'd all just gotten behind Trump, they were like the least likely to say that it's important, which is great. Because uh, they, they, at least they recognized, you yeah. know, they they were convincing themselves he was a good guy. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> they were being consistent. They're they're just like they they figured out a way to, you know, that that was the easiest way to deal with the the cognitive dissonance, I guess. But because they, they saw that he was. Um, a bad guy. He was, you know, that he's a, clearly a sinner. He's clearly not. A, if you if you won't ask for forgiveness, he's not a Christian in the right kind of way. Um, but he and and his t and he didn't pretend. This is the thing. He didn't he didn't uh, cater to evangelicals. Like he didn't pretend to like care about God or anything. The Bible. Like he's like I changed my mind about abortion. I guess. Um, and uh, you know, I've got no problem with the gays. It's like whatever, um, but like all he did, you know, like the old salesman trick, just assume the sale. Like he just kept telling you, you just go and be like, you know, who loves me? The evangelicals love me. You know, and at first that wasn't true, and he just kept saying it until it was. Well, he also and, knew, he also did know the key buttons to push. I was re-listening to the the other day to the question where I guess Megyn Kelly said, "You said this about women, and you've said that about women, and you've said that about women." And he makes a little joke about Rosie O'Donnell, and then he and then he starts saying America has a problem with political correctness. And I remember when I first heard that, I thought this is kind of incoherent. You're not answering the question, blah blah blah. But then I realized he know he's got like several things he wants to say. You'll we'll say Merry Christmas. 
in my administration. Mm -hmm. Political correctness is bad. Build a wall. He had about five talking points that were the poll-tested talking points, and he just kept getting back to them. So it wasn't entirely articulating a self-fulfilling prophecy. I mean, he, he no. skillfully it was it was harnessed. other thing that the other things that they wanted. He just didn't he just didn't pick out any religious things to say. Right, right. It was just all the other things that, that those voters wanted. People are upset about right. Yeah, yeah. He hit those relentlessly, and that brought him around, despite the fact that he didn't even. Have it, 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 and the thing is, I think it was probably smart because he he w he would have looked like an idiot if he tried to pretend that he was like uh, you know a holy yeah sort of pious yeah. you know believing Christian. And in fact, being candid about that played into one thing his supporters liked about him is he's not a conventional politician. That was kind of an asset. But I think his you know the the key thing was he recognized that you want to you want to harness what it is that people hate. You know, it's like, yeah, they have these religious values, but values are just values. Let's focus on who they hate, and let's convince them that I hate the same people. And that was basically it. That was basically the whole campaign. Yeah. And, you know, I, I want to say something quickly, though, uh, just in, in anticipation of the commenters who will cl complain about the Trump bashing. I realized only recently that Hillary's ma mistake may have been she also maybe not a campaign of hatred, but it was a campaign of fear. I mean, what I didn't like about Trump was that he exploited people's fears and hatreds, but Hillary's campaign was all about fear. Donald Trump will do this to you. Donald Trump will do that to you. You know, if you're in this group, Donald Trump will do, you know, and she never got beyond that. But I digress. Yeah. So, so okay, so another issue. So, okay, so there's, there's, um, there are the social issues. Another issue of relevance to you as a libertarian is immigration. Now, you've traditionally, I've thought of you as kind of an open borders guy. You did in this piece in Vox, I think you were kind of celebrating the way capitalism has brought ethnic diversity to countries mm -hmm. almost inexorably. Um, do, do you, do you, are you now starting to think, well, maybe there are limits to how fast you can move. Maybe uh, immigration policy should be mindful of how fast people can absorb change, and in fact, of actual short-term, uh, you know, zero-sum games between competing workers, you know, for jobs. Uh, are, are you holding fast to, uh, to open? No, I mean, it's definitely got me, I mean, like, I, I, I think there's probably something wrong with you if you're not, uh, if you're not, if you're not thinking about it. The, the, I mean, what I, what I, what I wrote up in that Vox piece, and I think it is true, I was trying to give some account of, this was before the election, and when I thought, Clinton was going to win, but I was trying to understand something about some of Trump's voters in a way that wasn't um, just impugning them of, you know, wasn't just accusing them of being racist or, or uh, you know, like, just like bad, nasty, illiberal people. And the way I was thinking about it was in terms of the speed of cultural change. And, and, and it really is dramatic like i like one of the things i pointed out in that piece is when i was born in 1973 um that was just a couple years out from the lowest point of percentage of foreign-born population in the united states in american history that lowest that low point was like in 68 or 69 um so when my older sister was born um the the U.S. had incredibly restrictive immigration policy beginning in the 20s all the way up to 1965 when uh, Johnson passed um, this big immigration um, bill, which significantly liberalized American immigration. Um, and that had massive unintended consequences on uh, the sort of demographic shape of the American population. Um, they were actually expecting a lot more Europeans to come. Uh, they hadn't thought really deeply about the way the kind of family reunification emphasis in the law would lead to kind of chain migration from Mexico because there already was big Mexican populations here um, because of the Bracero programs of the 40s and 50s and stuff like that. Or like big Asian populations started coming over in big waves. And that wasn't really predicted. Um, and by the time, you know, my son was born a couple years ago, you know, uh, the U.S. was at its, you know, getting close again to 
the kind of Ellis Island era foreign-born population, but in a much, much, much in a larger, more populous country. Um, and to go from kind of the, you know, the the the, the trough to the peak in, um, you know, in 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 the lifetime of one person, I think is does create a a sense of um, a kind of vertigo. Um, where you know, like my dad, when he when I was born, he brought his son into a very very white country that had a racial dynamic that was like white black, um, and that he understood. Um, and now my hometown, where he was chief of police, uh, is twenty five percent Mexican, which is where Marshalltown, Iowa, um, and uh, and like and and you know on Facebook, I see all my my friends and. Marshalltown be like this is not the place we grew you know grew up there you know people complain about it they don't you know like it's it's a lot to take um and and so like I uh you know if you're ever going to offer me the choice between more immigration or less immigration I'm always going to go for more immigration I think just like the the humanitarian case for it is just decisive um but I do think it has um well so the piece in box that I that 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 we've been talking about I, I. I was largely talking about you know what that does to a shared sense of of national identity, what it means to be an American, um, and we don't really update our cultural deep sort of cultural programming after we get to a certain age, um, and you know like I like I always like this factoid that people just stop listening to new music when they're about thirty, you just listen to the same music for the rest of your life right like i think that's kind of kind of indicative of the way you know we're cultural animals are like prime adaptation is to absorb and integrate culture we copy our parents we just take in the ambient stuff but once you know like our language learning like once we once we've done it it's kind of set and I, so i think it really is hard for people in their middle age or older years to um, adapt to a really, really rapidly changing culture, um, and 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 I don't think we need to chalk it up to sort of like hatred or xenophobia, right. rather than just a sense of like just dislocation and confusion. That that still sounds patronizing, but I don't mean it to be, um, because I just feel like it's just it's just confusing. Like where where am I? Mm-hmm. Like why aren't people speaking English in this airport? Like what? Like mm. you know what country is this? Like, and, and you can just feel like, like this is the town that I grew up in. And like, why are there, why is like a quarter of the town Mexican? Like, it's just, it's confusing to people. Um, and, and I do think that that can, so that, that, that does push in the direction of, of thinking very carefully about what the limits of normal sort of tolerance for change are and trying to come up to that limit without going over it in a way that creates a backlash that wipes out the humanitarian gains that you otherwise would have made. Mm -hmm. So do you, um, so you you seem to be working to understand the perspective of people who you might say are on the other side of this issue than you. The, the, The issue being, or the tension being between cosmopolitanism and kind of nationalism or ethno nationalism or whatever you want to call it. Do you think that Trump opponents are doing a good enough job of that generally? I mean, you it may be a little easier for you. You grew oh. up in Iowa. Um, but 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 what what is your take on that? I think they're doing a terrible job so far. Um and which I find distressing. Um and I and I do think it comes from this, you know, I'm going to call it moral polarization. Um, it, it, it's just it's it's hard it's hard to get across the gap sympathetically. The further you get apart, um, the more sympathy feels like complicity with injustice. I mean, the conservatives are the same way about let's try to understand the terrorists. Right. right. Like like every time there's a terrorist attack, I'm like, what are they upset about? Right. And they're like, oh, you can't try to understand them. Like like you just have right. to like they're bad. You so you just have to wipe them out. Right, and and I feel like there's a little bit too much of that. Like, um, and so I don't feel like there's so on the cosmopolitan liberal side, I feel like there is, and and, and there there are there are like fads for like let's all read you know hillbilly elegy, <laughs> uh, and let's all 
uh, you know, like, and let's worry about, you know, people addicted to oxy and stuff like that. And, you know, it, it, and it's it, it's great to do, but but mostly it's still coming from this um, kind of condescending. Well, I don't want to put words in your mouth, which I apparently yeah. tried to do. Coming from He's, this what? Um, yeah, I mean, con- like coming from a um, elitist place where it's like this is our country and we run it. Um, something has gone wrong with these people, and we need to figure out what we need to do to fix them. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's not the right attitude. Um, so is the is the writer attitude to emphasize that the reactions they're having are just human reactions? Uh, that you a you would have in their if you were in their shoes and b reactions of the sort that you're actually probably having along some other dimension even as we speak right I mean there's yeah. we all have people we resent for example right yeah <laughs> well, well I, I mean the, 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 I think I think it's really really hard okay like it's really really hard because it, you have to deal with a lot of um, moral complexity and ambiguity where where um, so you like, because people want you, like even people who are like, uh, you know, the people who are claiming not to be tribal or are, are tribal, right? Like we're all tribal. Exactly. Right? And, and so, and so when, um, the, so if I'm, if I'm asking, if I'm asking somebody, uh, to my left, say to like, okay, you just need to understand that, that, that the traditional religious sexual morality that has existed for a couple thousand years or something like that, uh, you know, um, you know more about religion than I do, but like, that, that, you know, these things are sometimes newer than you think, but like, um, that, like, you gotta let people have it. Um, like, like, like it's just, um, it's just not gonna work out to try to get them to not have it. So what we need to do is figure out a way of um, letting people live their own lives uh, according to their religions uh, in a way that doesn't restrict the liberty of people who say, like, want to marry somebody of the same sex. Right? Like, we have to try to figure out a way of having progressive social change that doesn't tread too much on... And, 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 I, and, and you, the tension that you feel immediately... Is if you like if you're like okay like like I think my dad uh, who is a cop um, was upset about Black Lives Matter and he I, he like like I I, I like never get a, an email from my father but like the, like the one email I've gotten from my father in like twenty years had to do with how he feels like nobody respects cops anymore mm-hmm. um, and and I and. I feel like it's just hard to say, um, I see where he's coming from without feeling like you're, um, um, refusing solidarity with Black Lives Matter, Mm. right? Like, it feels like these things just feel like you have to pick. Right. Um, and, and that if you're in, um, a community that, uh, um, Sorry, did I go away for a second? No, you're fine. You just were suddenly illuminated. It may, may be that you're actually having an illumination, that you're about to say <laughs> something so profound yeah. that uh, that some sort of divine light is shining through. It, it's a great look, so just go ahead and talk. Yeah, so, so, if, I, so if I live in you know a, a really progressive college town, um, it's going to be more important for me to signal that I'm with the movements that matter to us, right. um, and, and and that and that any and that and that any kind of any any kind of move of authentic connection and engagement um, that that is respectful toward the people who are actually the main impediment to the progressive social change that you're trying to bring mm-hmm. about, that looks yeah. like <clears throat> sleeping with the enemy yeah. or something, and I think it's really 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 difficult for people to manage. Um, and, and, and that one of the reasons we're kind of having, I still think like, uh, that, 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 the, that the 
cosmopolitan side of it is doing kind of a poor job is partly the 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 inability to just go to just go all in and say you know what I'm going to start treating people that I that I whose views I find abhorrent with respect and um, treating th- their moral convictions as if they have a kind of legitimacy, even though I think that they're responsible for the perpetuation of injustice, it's hard to do. It is hard, you know, and it has something to do with just intellectual humility, the recognition that you may not be, well, you may not be completely right about certain issues, and you may, being subject to human self-deception, you may be guilty of more things than yourself than you realize, maybe in wholly other domains, but you just may not be perfect. And, uh, but it's really hard. I mean, it's hard for a couple of reasons, I think. One, I want to spotlight that you mentioned, because I think this is a really underrated problem. You said that when you try to understand somebody, you, you get accused of sympathizing with them. You try to understand the terrorists, and they say, as Ann Coulter once said about me, that I, I think she said I, uh, what was it? I have affection for terrorists, I think she said. I, mm-hmm. I think this thing is, is, I think this is built into the human brain. This is conjectural and theoretical, but I think the intuition that explaining some why someone did something that is considered bad is an attempt to absolve them of responsibility. I really think that's like a, an instinct almost, and you have to consciously work to get around it. But I think that is a huge impediment to human progress. Yeah, and and, and, and you're seeing it in this context. You know, for the reasons that you said, and you know, Trump complicates the problem because to people like you and me, I think you know he seems like a pretty abhorrent character. So the people who support him, you know, by inference, it's hard for us to think sympathetically about, and it's mm-hmm. natural when you say, "Well, let's try to understand these people." To, to say, wait a second, this, this guy is fascism in the making, you know? Did understanding, you know, was under, not understanding Hitler the problem, you know, and so on. Actually, right. it may have been, in a certain sense, not understanding what, what created support for him. But, um, but in any event, so I think, you know, that's all, it is a, it is a problem, and I don't have an immediate solution. Um, no, I mean, and, and, it, and it's a kind of, I think, a... Uh... A perpetual liberal fallacy to to think that if uh, um, that if we can do a better job of um, of understanding people, that somehow that's going to solve the problem. It doesn't really solve the problem. Not um, by itself, but it can be yeah. the first step. Yeah, but it's a, but it, but it's an important step. And and but for me, what I think of the important thing is so you know sort of diagnosing some of the problems that are that that came from. The, by the way, I wanted to step back for a second. Here's a thought that had kind of gone through my mind that that when you kind of mentioned the sort of cosmopolitan versus sort of nationalist distinction, mm-hmm. one thing that I want to be careful of is 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 that I'm not sure it's as stark as that, right? Like, and I and I don't want to just give it. Um, I don't want to just give nationalism over to anti-cosmopolitanism. Because I think part of the issue that we've been having um, is this question about what do you do with this rapidly evolving um, American national identity, and 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 there I think there are kind of competing conceptions of national identity. We are a multicultural nation, and there is a multicultural American identity um, that um, it's just it's just not everybody shares it. Right, like, and so, 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 there is a kind of cosmopolitan. You could, ha- you can imagine a a cosmopolitan American nationalism. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Right, like, 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 you, you yeah. know, the, yeah. like, Canada has really cultivated its self conception as right. being a multicultural nation, and I think that is that that has mostly become dominant in a way where the uh, the the really sort of Anglo uh, Canadian nationalism. Uh, it has been really kind of displaced by it, um, and, and and so at this point, Canadian nationalism is about a kind of multicultural cosmopolitan right. uh, viewpoint, um, and and that's your best bet for nationalism. That's that that's the most liberal nationalism you can have. 
Um, and so I'm, I'm not, so I'm not sure our, the, the, our problem is exactly between. Um, no, I agree. I mean, I've long thought that America's, you know, my conception of American greatness, my conception of what, you know, a, a, a version of Manifest Destiny updated would be America's mission is to show the world how to make, uh, you know, things like diversity work. I mean, we, we have long been on the forefront of this. You know, it's like Scandinavians 40 years ago were giving us sermons about, you know, our race relations problem. Well, easy for them to say, I mean, right? I mean, back then, some right. of them are finding out now it's complicated. And it is complicated. Um, but we, you know, by and large, we've done a pretty good job of it. And uh, and it's it's one of the kinds of things I think we could say is great about us, and and it's one of the things you know we should think of it as being our mission to show the world that these kinds of things can work, coexistence of, you know, uh, and coexistence of the different kind of values you referred to, uh, uh, you know, not just ethnic coexistence, um, you know, and so on. So so I think I don't know if that's exactly what you're saying but and it and it's certainly more challenging to rally people to that conception of greatness than it is to rally them to the idea that we can kick anybody's butt but um but you know i i i i don't think it's impossible for a politician to pick up on that and and it just reminds me what a total dearth of kind of inspirational vision there's been you know <laughs> yeah. on, on my side of the the political spectrum yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, something that you said made me think. Uh, I think we've always been relatively good at diversity, um, and part of it comes from the fact that we've always we you know the United States is really the first country really founded on liberal principles, and there's always been a debate about what you know which cultures were suited to um liberal values and liberal institutions and you know among the american founding fathers you know some of the anglo guys were worried about germans and some of the and so you like like so there's you know and everybody thought I, the irish were trash and the italians were um you know you know maybe you know almost white people who knows right so there was you know like so it was it was, it was always complicated but still we were re always relatively and, and of course uh, African Americans were enslaved uh, and Native Americans were eradicated so don't want to leave that out yeah no, uh, so that, I don't, that I don't is mean not... to say our history has been for all 200 years you know yeah uh, uh, an, an, an unmitigated success by any means but the transition we've been in the process of making it seems to me until very recently had been headed in the right direction anyway go ahead yeah yeah uh, I agree and 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 a lot of it comes from I mean we, we we've groped toward just the sort of fundamental liberal principles from the beginning I mean like a lot of people forget that the, that the, that the that the that the source of sort of liberalism as a sort of intellectual construct, you know, comes from, like, the wars of religion that, that, that literally different revealed doctrines were incompatible, and the populations of people who you know, held to those doctrines thought, you know, like, it's either us or them, right? Like, like, like uh, first we have to save their souls, and if we can't save their souls, they're a, da a, a danger to our souls because we're letting them mingle with our children, and they might taint them, and they'll learn heresies, and blah blah blah. And and but that creates this sort of zero sum strife that is so awful that at a certain point they're like, hey, wouldn't it be better to just like, like, and and the, this is something that's really high stakes. What could be more high stakes than right. the the fate of your eternal soul? We have to figure out a way. Of just getting along, despite the fact that we have this fundamental disagreement about the nature of the universe and goodness and the way we're supposed to live our lives, uh, and that's kind of what liberalism bubbles up out of. And I feel like what we've gotten to, like part of our problem, is we're moving back toward a, a kind of zero-sum culture war that is a lot, a little bit like a war of religion except the secular cosmopolitans don't see their moral worldview as analogous to a religion. Right. Um, and so they, they think it has a kind of 
scientific authority, say, that, that, that legitimates um, imposing it on non-believers um, that is somehow different from one religious sect imposing its religion on another. Right. I mean, let me uh, uh, um, pause and say, I don't, I do not see religious belief as as uh, determinative in these contexts as you may. I mean, my own view is a little Marxist here, where I think often the invocation of religious doctrine as a, as an excuse for doing stuff is is more of an epiphenomenon. I mean, we we both agree that that it turns out that 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 the religious values of these Trump voters are extremely malleable. I mean, so so in other you talked about a zero sum game between religious ideas. I think often it's the perception of zero sumness on the ground in terms of material interests that leads people to emphasize. I mean, Northern Ireland's perfect example. That was not about the question of whether justification by faith or justification by works is right. right. And right. but it, but it broke along religious lines. And I think the good news, actually, the good news is that a lot in the way of seemingly conflicting religious ideas can be reconciled. It's like, it's like, you know, I don't think there's a lot of religious dispute in business class, so to speak, right? I mean, in other words, if, if a mm -hmm. Hindu from India meets a Christian and they think they can do business, if they, if they perceive that they have a non-zero-sum relationship on the ground in terms of material interest, people have a way of overcoming their religious differences. And I think that's the good news. You know, you may you may differ in your emphasis, but anyway, that's no, my I view. think that's the good news too. Yeah, I, I think you're I think you're right about the, and I, I I it's been a while since I've done my diatribe about the new atheists, so I think I'm entitled to spend 15 seconds. But yeah. you know, but I think that attitude, right? The the uh, the the idea, and actually, this gets back to a difference of opinion on this very issue. The new atheists disagree with me. They think religious ideas are the problem. So they have to go grab religious people by the shoulders and shake them and say, if you'll just see things my way, everything will be okay. And I'm pretty sure that's the opposite of the constructive approach. And um, so again, I, I think it kind of gets back to intellectual humility. Um, by the way, do you agree that Bill Maher is a... <laughs> he's been singled out by a couple people lately as embodying the elite uh, self-congratulations, so, you know, self-congratulatory attitude that so drives these people crazy. Um, I don't really watch Bill Maher, but, I, but yeah, my sense of him is that he's, that he's pretty smug. I mean, I, I think there's really something to that view. I mean, like, like there, was, there was a really good piece by, you know, came out, sometime last year by Emmett Renson on the sort of smug style in American politics that was in Vox and, 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 you know, that was coming from the left. Uh, and then, you know, Ross Douthat had a New York times piece that was widely mocked, but I thought it was actually pretty good about, you know, just the, just kind of the unrelenting condescension of mm -hmm. a, a lot of, you know, like the daily show, that kind of stuff. And, and, and how, uh, the cumulative effect of that is to is is to people a lot of just regular Americans just see themselves as the object of contempt and ridicule um, and 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 I feel like that is like actually a failure of fundamental liberal principles that you that 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 liberal tolerance is about treating people who are different from you uh, with a certain level of respect. And it's hard, and, and and it's hard to reconcile um, real liberal tolerance that treats people with respect with um, a sort of vehement um, push for um, for social change. Now, this is just another one of those tensions where if if you're like we have to like people are dying in the streets because um, because police don't treat the lives of young black men like they matter we have to do something about this now it's urgent right like and that's true like that's true we it, that 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 attitude of urgency um makes it makes it very really very difficult to treat somebody who is skeptical of black lives matter with respect it's like why do you want black people to die mm -hmm. right like i'm supposed to treat you with respect but, but you don't give a shit about whether these people are dying, right? Like, it's it's just too hard. 
right? Like, and and I and and that's why, like, I get worried about this the the divergence of worldviews. That the further apart they get, the hard just the harder it gets to um, even talk to somebody on the other side of the divide without thinking that they're just that they're the problem, that they are active agents doing irreparable harm to our society. Um, and it just, you know, and it really is parallel. Like, I happen to agree with people on the side of progressive social change about pretty much every issue that's at least non-economic, um, but, the, um, but I do worry about the ability to bring people along in a way that is going to consolidate those changes. Um, and, and, and that's why I, 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 recently I've been thinking a lot about, um, you know, about Martin Luther King and Nelson Mandela and the important role that, like, reconciliation plays in, 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 in big dramatic shifts in norms that stick. Like, the, like the ability to say, I think you recognize that this is wrong and that you've been behind it. You've been supporting it all this time, but I guarantee you that if you do the right thing, you're off the hook, mm -hmm. right? And we're not going to come after you. Um, and, 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 and that I think there's a kind of cultural version of that where that we're kind of failing at, um, where it's like, it's like, okay, you've, you've come along on gay marriage maybe, but now there's this other thing that you need to come along on or, and and I feel like a lot of conservatives feel like they're just like they can't win. Like if you if if it's like okay, I, I softened up on gay marriage, but now people want me to change what pronoun I use for Bruce Jenner, and and just like I can't and and and, and if I won't do it, I'm the world's worst person, and they're just think I can't and freaking also, win. Also, speaking from the uh, my own perspective as someone who's older than you, people I think some young people don't appreciate how just hard it is to remember all this stuff as you get older. It, it just becomes harder. It's like, I have a friend with a transgender kid, and I just keep, you know, I, it's hard to say him. It's just hard yeah. to remember to say it. You, you absorbed culture kid. in 1970 something. Yeah, and you I, I don't care. It's, yeah. it, it, it's like when they mocked Bob Dole for saying Brooklyn Dodgers instead of Los Angeles Dodgers. I totally get that. It had nothing to do with any kind of prejudice about Brooklyn or Los Angeles. It's just stuff gets locked in your head. It, it is. It, it it can be challenging. Um, yeah. The uh, but I don't want. That's the thing. Okay, the the thing that I get frustrated with. Like I don't want. I don't. I don't want the. I don't want the kids to stop pushing. Right. Right. Like I just don't. Right. Like and so it, um it, so the you know the people who are best at seeing where the injustice is seeing where you know the shoe chafes uh, are younger people of the communities that are being oppressed um and 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 I don't think it's their job to be paying attention to what um you know AARP members can um, remember to say, um, but at the same time, um, like if there's too much space, it's a problem. So I feel like, like, like so I think there's 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 got to be a role for a kind of mediation between like like I don't know people like me who are who are kind of old, um, but sympathetic to what young people are doing. Um, but also sympathetic to just how old it is to be seventy-five years old and ha and and mm -hmm. suddenly not know what country you're living in, and try to in some way mediate between the 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 progressive forces and the just sort of conservative reactionary forces in a way that that smooths out the tension. Mm -hmm. um, I don't actually know what I'm saying, but. Uh, like somebody needs to do something. Sounded really good. Sounded really good. Uh, no, I mean it <clears throat> feeds into a, a, a tiresome sermon of mine about the salvation of the world lying, and just people getting better at and more inclined to look at things from the perspective of everyone, no matter how loathsome they find. Just try to do the mental exercise. I'm not talking about feeling their pain or caring about their welfare. Just mm. do the mental exercise of trying to imagine. How they view the world, and you, you know, you mentioned uh, Martin Luther King and Mandela and reconciliation, but I think the success of both of them 
begins with an ability to look at the other side, to look at the people on the other side and anticipate what the reaction is going to be. Like Mandela thinking, well, how are they going to react if we try to, you know, if we just try to completely uh, flip things around here and suddenly mm -hmm. they are the dominated, uh, you know, ethnicity and so on. Um, so, and, and, I, and I think to get back to something you said earlier, I think both sides here uh, are not doing a very good job of, not only not doing a great job of looking at things from the vantage point of the other, but in both sides there are all these pressures on them, these like peer pressures, by, by virtue of their being members of a tribe and subscribing to the values that put them on one side of the issue or the other. You know, the, the membership of the tribe puts a lot of pressure on them not to look at things from the point of view of the others, and certainly not to talk about it. Certainly, yeah. certainly not to say, well, imagine you were a cop, you know, mm -hmm. um, or on the other side, maybe to say, imagine you were a, a, a black kid who knows that whenever he walks in a drugstore, he's looked at in a different way than a white kid is looked at. Um, so that's, uh, I guess if we've gotten back to my, a standard sermon of mine that, uh, everyone has heard me give already. Maybe it's close to time to call it quits. We're, we're past an hour. There's a, there's a lot of stuff I'd wanted to ask you about, so maybe we can have another conversation. I mean, there's the authoritarianism sure. issue that you've written about that is a, maybe a looming concern here um, to you particularly as a libertarian mm -hmm. or libertarian. So there's a lot of stuff we can talk about. Is, is there anything you want to say in closing uh, before we wrap this one up? No. Uh, I just, you know... I I feel like I feel like your sermon, Bob, is like the liberal sermon, uh, and 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 like just try to try to try to see things from other people's point of view, um, and uh, and 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 there's something funny about that in some ways. Like try to see things from the point of view of somebody who's never going to see things from anybody else's point of view. Right. Um, and uh, uh, and. And realize that you can't ever ask them to do what you're asking other people to do, or that there's something self-defeating about asking them to do that. Uh, if you ask everybody to do it, you haven't done it, <laughs> right? Well, right, because if you don't, because part of doing it successfully would be to recognize that basically we all have people we're just not going to listen to. We're not going to we're not going to take instruction from. And they're not going to take instruction from me. I mean that that is one of the things you can I mean that that's one insight is to understand that the Trump voters aren't going to take instruction from me, but but the, I think the deeper insight is to understand that, that we all have people like that. We all have people whose messages we are not receptive to. Uh and anyway, I guess I've uh, I, when I approach this level of sanctimoniousness, it's definitely time time to call yeah. it a day. What I, the way I try to think of it is like is is like who is getting in the way of of the progress I want to make, and then what is it that I have to do to make sure that they will listen to me, or that right? yeah, yeah, or or that um, they will listen to someone that they will be receptive. To some influence projected by someone that will move things in what you think is the right direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so you can't make the fact that you want something that, like your commitment to, and this is what I worry happens, is that is that uh, commitment to a liberal goal um, ends up entailing that most of what you do is signal your commitment to the liberal goal in a way that precludes the people who are standing in the way from taking you seriously, right? And so the more seriously you actually take the achievement of the goal, um, the more, if, if the people on your side don't think you're reactionary, you're not doing a good job. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, but of course then you start losing credibility with them and it's harder to bring them along with you. I mean, this is there's just yeah. a, it, it's a difficult it's a balancing act. It's a difficult challenge. Uh, but we will figure it out and uh, instruct all Americans on what they are to do, and then they will follow us, right? <laughs> right, because they all pay attention to us. Right. Uh, okay. Well, thanks, Will. Let's let's definitely do this again. I think we're yeah. we're, we're making incremental progress here, and uh, enjoy life at the 
give me the pronunciation again. Niskanen. 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 That's somebody's it's, last name. I, I yeah, see. it's named after Bill Niskanen, who was the chairman of the Cato Institute for many years. Oh, I see. Well, yeah, so but, was it, did this result? I mean, there was tension within Cato at one point. Is this one faction or something? Uh, uh, Bill's death was the event that precipitated um, the fight between um, the Cokes and the I sort see. of incumbents. About they have a a, a structure. A management structure that's based on shares, uh, like a corporation. Mm -hmm. um, but there was no nothing in the charter. I, uh, this is about what happens when a shareholder dies, and so the 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 mm -hmm. the, the Coke Cato fight was about who, what happened to those shares. Um, and, mm -hmm. and 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 there is a sense in which we kind of come out of that in a way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. All right. And we encourage people to read anything you've written. You're writing for Vox every so often. Uh, and we'll, we'll Very infrequently lately, but yeah. somewhere I saw it claimed that you were some kind of regular contributor, and and I encourage you not to, not to claim otherwise. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Will. Great talking to you, Bob. Talk to you soon. Okay.